Okay, uh, welcome PCS members and our friends uh, to our today's IBS PCS seminar. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have with us uh, Dr. Ruth Shear, and I would like to invite our scientific host, uh, Dario, to introduce our speaker. Please, Dario. Okay, thanks, Dylan. Uh, so yeah, it's a pleasure to have Ruth uh, today to give, um, to give her talk about operator complexity, the long story. So let me introduce her. Uh, so she got her PhD degree in the Hebrew University in 2017 under the, under the let's say, her mentor was Barack Cole. And um, I mean, I would say that somehow Ruth's career is more or less similar to mine in the sense that she changed her topic uh, in due, I mean, in the last few years. So she started and she did a PhD, let's say, in high energy physics, working mostly, I would say, in uh, amplitudes. Uh, but recently, she turned her, uh, her research interest to, let's say, quantum many body physics and many body dynamics. And indeed, today, she's going to talk about operator complexity, the long story. And so, Ruth, please, you can start. So thanks, Dar Dario. It's a great pleasure for me to, to give the talk at uh, PCS. Um, and firstly, uh, I can't say I really changed topics because the reason we got interested in operator complexity, uh, of course, comes uh, our background motivation comes from uh, trying to understand uh, long time scale, long time scale uh, phenomena in black hole physics within the framework of ADS-CFT. Um, so we wanted to uh, to to get to, to understand some more about um, the the quantum phenomenon, which hopefully. Uh, has also a bulk description, um, but today we will we will concentrate only on the quantum mechanical aspect of this topic. And uh, the title of my talk is "Operator Complexity: The Long Story," because we're going to talk about long time scales, very long time scales. Um, the more technical uh, title uh, is. Creel of complexity, exploring the complete Hilbert space of operator time evolution. Uh, so I didn't want to scare everybody off by uh, introducing all sorts of uh, complicated notions. And I just decided to give uh, the talk a, a simple title, uh, which does uh, describe what the talk is about. Um, so let me uh, tell you, uh, firstly, this, this talk is based on the following two papers, mainly on the first one listed, which was uh, published recently. It is work with uh, Eliezer Rabinovich uh, from Hebrew U, Adrian Sanchez Garrido, and Julian Zoner from Geneva University. And uh, um, in a sense, of course, it's also uh, uh, based on a previous paper I published together with uh, Jose Barbon from Madrid. Uh, Eliezer Rabinovich and uh, Ritam Sinha from, from Madrid as well. Um, and in the, in the earlier paper, we, we introduced for the first time the, the notion, the idea of using Kriel of complexity um, to investigate, investigate a long, a long time evolution of, of uh, operator complexity. Uh, in the paper I'm going to foc focus on today, um, which is the first one listed here, we performed uh, full numerical uh, computations on a specific model, as I will describe in this talk. Um, so so this is, this is the, these are the papers uh, we're ba I'm based on. And let me um, t tell you about the outline of the talk. So I will give an introduction where I firstly will uh, tell you a little bit about what is quantum complexity, uh, what are the main features. Um, then we will introduce a specific notion of quantum complexity known as Krylov complexity. And I will describe the methods which lead to it. Um, eventually we will arrive at the actual definition of Krylov complexity. We will also uh, introduce a new concept uh, known as, as K, and, uh, which we uh, called Krylov entropy. And finally, we will show uh, the complete numerical results for SYK with four fermion interaction. So this is, this is the outline for the talk. Um, 
so firstly, let's let's uh, let's start with what is quantum complexity. So we are all on the same footing. And uh, the informal way of describing quantum complexity is the measure of how hard it is to create a quantum state or operator, starting with some simple state or operator using a fixed set of operations, which are known as gates. Now, more precisely, um, we, we define quantum complexity as the minimal number of gates needed to reach an epsilon distance away from a target state or operator while starting at some reference state or operator. So uh, clearly using a, a bunch of gates, we're not going to arrive exactly at the operator uh, we're looking for, but we could always arrive an epsilon distance away. Um, and a well-known uh, theorem in, uh, in quantum computation is that in a system with n qubits, uh, the quantum complexity of a typical stator operator uh, is goes like uh, it goes exponential in the number of qubits and uh, also depends uh, on the tolerance parameter as log of one over epsilon. Uh, so as epsilon becomes smaller, uh, we will of course need more gates to uh, arrive at uh, our target stator operator, and. The, the, the main thing we want to take from, uh, qu from quantum computational complexity is the general features. And I want to draw for you how the, what the general features of quantum uh, complexity look like. Um, so we will focus on, on how the complexity of a quantum operator goes. Uh, so a quantum operator evolves in time uh, in a unitary fashion. And in, in, the, in theory of quantum computation, we could describe a unitary as a multiplication, as, as, a, as a set of gates which are available in the quantum computer. Um, now, it is, it is uh, important to, to notice that uh, quantum complexity evolves for, for very long times. And if we have n qubits for a system of n qubits, the, the features of quantum complexity uh, look as follows. Firstly, there is a bound. So the bound goes uh, exponential in the number of degrees of freedom, and that is the number we cited previously. And that's essentially the uh, complexity for a, so the complexity of a typical stator operator is actually uh, the maximal complexity. Um, then at every time step, we apply the same number of local gates, which means that there is a period before we arrive at saturation, there is a period of linear growth. So, uh, clear, so this point here where we uh, change from linear to saturation is at time scales of order exponential in the number of qubits. And um, if we look carefully and we notice that at very early times, applying gates to the operator in the in the following fashion, um, as follows. Results in a shorter circuit than you would expect because each of the gates here is uh, usually a local gate. It's, it acts only on a finite number of qubits and the seed operator, the initial operator where we're looking at a time evolution is also local. So what happens is that initially many of the gates cancel out. They commute with the operator and cancel out on both sides. This means that the initial, um, initial growth of complexity starts up non-linearly. And if you check it out, you would see there's some kind of exponential growth here. And this exponential growth lasts for times of order log in the number of qubits and, um, and the complexity at the end of this, of this growth period 
is of order n. Once, um, once, uh, it, once the, 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 the circuit defining this operator uh, knows about all the qubits in the circuit, it starts growing linearly. So these are the general features we expect. Um, uh, just a remark, uh, at very, very long time scales, we expect to have a Poincaré recurrence, but that's at time scales. Uh, so it's really at time scales at, of order exponential, exponential in, in the number of qubits. And then we expect complexity to go down again and uh, start doing the whole thing from the beginning. But that's uh, not part of, of, of what we're going to uh, explore today. Um, so let me know if, if this picture is pretty much clear. We only need the general features of quantum uh, complexity for this talk. So this is for any, let's say, any possible measure of quantum complexity. You are not committing with a particular measure, right? I mean, you say any meaningful measure of quantum complexity should be having it this way. Yeah, we're expecting these, these features from quantum complexity. Okay. Yes. And you are referring to a genetic system. I mean, let's say chaotic. I mean, you are not... Yes, yes, yes. Essentially, this is for a chaotic system. That's right. So the Hamiltonian okay. is k-local and there's alt-wall interaction. Indeed, indeed. Right. Um, so any other questions? Uh, um, Okay, should I wait some more or? No, 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 you can go. Okay, okay perfect. Um, so this, these are the generic features. And uh, today we will discuss a specific notion of complexity, which does not need neither gates nor a tolerance parameter. And um, also we do not need to search for any minimum number of gates. So no need for geodesics or metrics or any, anything of the sort. Um, <clears throat> so all we need to know is how an operator evolves in time. So let's take some operator. And we know it evolves in the Heisenberg picture um, as written in equation one uh, using the Baker-Campbell house door uh, decomposition. We could write it as a kind of Taylor series. Um, and from this, uh, from this uh, decomposition, we see that uh, the operator, as it evolves in, in time, uh, is a linear combination of operators in the subspace spanned by the operator um, and, and nested commutators with a Hamiltonian. And uh, the main thing to, to take from this uh, very simple picture of how an operator evolves in time is that as time becomes larger, terms with more commutators, the Hamiltonian, become more important. So that's, that's the, main, that's the main, main thing to notice here. OK. Um, uh, sorry, now, Ruth, yes, yes. may I ask? So, so uh, in this case, then the the expansion breaks down, or I mean, uh, when when um, kind of time becomes large enough, right? No, it's an exponential, right? So an exponential really uh, converges for any time. It it really works for any time, right? I mean, where all we're doing is is uh, is expanding uh, this exponent. I mean, it's not. I mean, you write down uh, the exponential as a uh, as a Taylor series. And you work out the algebra, and you see that it, it has. It, it's really simple. It's just uh, just uh, sure. you know expanding the the exponential. So sure, it sure, work but at any time. It the expansion, it's, uh, you you just need to have then more and more terms that you yes, take into yes, account. Yes, yes, Because it's an mm -hmm. exponential operator, it it doesn't uh, diverge or anything. It's really well defined at any time. So mm -hmm. so yeah, that that, that that's fine. OK, um, thank you. And also, we will see that uh, we, could, we could make sense of this expansion in terms of a finite number of terms. And that's what we're going to do next. That's a good question. Thank you, uh, Tillin. Um, so let's make sense of this basis. We're, the next thing we're going to do is make sense of this, of this basis, um, which, as uh, Tillin said, essentially seems to have an infinite number of terms. Um, so uh, to, do this, to do this, we're going to uh, use a well-known definition, which is known as uh, the Krylov subspace. And we will, uh, to, just to make notation a little bit simpler, let's define uh, a superoperator, which is an operator that acts in operators. Um, 
it is defined as a commutator with the Hamiltonian, as written in uh, in two. Um, and we could identify the subspace uh, spanned by the operator and nested commutators of the Hamiltonian as the Krylov subspace of the Liouvillian operator. So um, the Krylov subspace is the span of all of these of these type of operators. Um, and notice that the Krylov, that the Krylov, uh, Krylov subspace is a subspace of the Hilbert space of operators. Um, the question we could ask ourselves, first of all, is what is the dimension of the subspace? Um, and to do that, let's do some simple analysis. Um, we'll work in the energy basis where things look very clear. Um, let's take a, uh, so first of all, we're talking about a finite Hilbert space. Uh, it is, it will be d-dimensional and it has some energy basis. And let's expand our operator in this basis in the following way. And notice that these operators, uh, the ket bra of uh, the energy eigenstates, are eigenstates of the Liouvillian with eigenvalues uh, given by the energy differences. So when we, you could actually do the algebra pretty simply, you just take the Liouvillian, you act on, on its uh, eigenstate, and you see that uh, its eigenvalue is exactly the energy difference. Um, and uh, given this, we see that the Liouvillian acts on the operator in a very simple way in the energy basis. It just, um, just multiplies every, uh, every element by powers of, of, uh, of energy differences. And in order to establish what the dimension of the span, what we've written before, the span of the operator and powers of, of the Liouvillian on the operator are, let's write down, uh, let's write down all, of the, all of the operators in, in this, in this uh, subspace in a matrix. So we're going to write them down in the, um, in, in, the uh, energy, in the energy operator basis. So each uh, term here is the, the, the coefficient in, in, this, uh, in, this, um, in, the, in the operator basis. So for example, this is the coefficient of one, one, this is the coefficient of one, two, and so on. And we will write down all of the operators. So first of all, the original operator, then the operator while I, when it's acted over by the uh, Liouvillian once, then twice, and so on. Um, and now, if we, if, we, if we understand the rank of this matrix, we know what is the dimension of the creative subspace. So that's uh, what we're going to do. So I've rewritten the matrix in nine. And note that uh, when we have a, uh, uh, that all the diagonal um, frequencies, all the diagonal uh, energy uh, differences are zero. So let's put all of the D elements with zero frequencies first, just to make things um, easier to see. And notice that this operate, this uh, matrix is, uh, it's, uh, length, it, it's a um, number of columns is d squared. And here we have as long as we want, right? We have any, any power of the Liouvillian on the, on the operator. So uh, the number of diagonal elements is d, and we're just saying that all of these guys, all of uh, these type of guys are zero. So we have d, of, d uh, elements in, on the diagonal. And uh, we have here left over uh, d squared minus d terms. And what we did is take the uh, matrix at the top and write it as a multiplication of matrices. If we understand what is the rank of each of these matrices, we know the dimension of the Krylov subspace. So firstly, notice that if we have any zero uh, among our our are our, um, among our operator um, coefficients, we will have a reduction in the Krylov subspace. 
Um, for these are these are the diagonal terms in the operator, and here uh, all we need is that at least one will be non-zero. So what we see is that uh, the first of all, the Krylov uh, space dimension depends on degeneracies in the spectrum of, of the Lebelian. If there's any any degeneracy among uh, the omegas, so for example, if omega one two equals omega one three, we have two columns which are the same and that will reduce the rank of of the left hand matrix another reason for a reduction in the creative space dimension would be a zero element every zero element in the energy in the of the operator in the energy basis will also remove one dimension so we find that, uh, that we find a, an upper bound on the Krylov space dimension. And uh, just to recap, it will be, we have one from here, one, uh, one, one independent direction from all of these, uh, these first columns. And if we have no degeneracies, we get d squared minus d terms from here, assuming that all of the, uh, all of the elements uh, of the operator in the energy basis are non-zero. So our conclusion is that there is a bound on the Krylov space dimension and uh, a dense operator, which has non-zero projection in every eigenstate of the Liouvillian, and there are uh, no degeneracies in the spectrum of, of the Liouvillian, will give us the largest possible Krylov space dimension. So notice that it is almost the size of the uh, Hilbert space of operators. It's almost the dimension of the Hilbert space of operators. So uh, the dimension of, uh, we could in the call it h squared, is d squared. And the dimension of the Krylov space is bounded by d squared minus d plus 1. Uh, so please ask any questions about, about this part. It's, uh, it's really a simple point. Uh, I hope it, it, uh, it came through. Okay. Okay. So um, let's see what we could say about uh, different types of quantum systems um, regarding the Krylov space dimension. And firstly, let's start with chaotic systems. In chaotic systems, we expect level repulsion. And therefore, we, we expect no degeneracies in the, in the energy spectrum, and therefore also no degeneracies in the uh, Liouvillian spectrum, except for the trivial ones, which uh, come from uh, same energy differences. And there's another important feature, is that typical uh, local operators are expected to follow uh, the eigenstate thermalization hypotheses, and which means that in particular they are dense in the energy basis, which means we are not expecting to have any uh, any zeros in the uh, matrix um, for the for the operator in the energy basis. Um, therefore, our conclusion is that we expect chaotic systems to saturate bound. So that's that's uh, that's the main that's uh, the the main conclusion here. Uh, for chaotic systems. Now, integrable systems are much more complicated. Uh, they, we expect in general Poisson statistics. We expect to have degeneracies. And also uh, because of the Poisson statistics, we expect to have quasi-degeneracies in the uh, energy spectrum and which um, is inherited by the Lenvillian spectrum. And we also expect uh, typical small operators uh, to be somewhat sparser in the energy basis. So all this makes the picture much more complicated, and I'm not going to uh, give any conclusions about integrable systems, except for uh, I want to give you an example, a very simple example, which is an uh, integrable system, uh, a free integrable system. Um, so firstly, uh, are there any questions about uh, what I've just said about uh, chaotic and integrable systems? Do you think you can, uh, I mean, you say that chaotic system will saturate the bound, but yeah. do you think you can, let's say, characterize the how much chaotic is the system depending how close you go to the bound? 
That's a, a good question. I think it really um, requires more study. I, I mean, this is pretty, right. uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, not many people really studied the complete uh, creedal space. It's very hard to study the complete creedal space. Um, and, and I will explain why. Um, so, okay, I mean, if you want to do it numerically, you will have a lot of uh, numerical instabilities in constructing the basis as we will, as we will discuss. Uh, so yeah, so I, I believe it's, it's a, a topic for, for, uh, for further research. Yeah, in particular, I was wondering if you can, I don't know, eh, but uh, because from the fact that you have level repulsion, you expect uh, uh, all, the, all the coefficients to be, let's say, sorry, all the, all the O's to be different. Uh, no, sorry, all the omega to be different. I was wondering if you can, but you know, level repulsion is just one um, one inch of, of chaos. You can, for example, study, let's say, spectral rigidity. So I was wondering if spectral rigidity somehow can be, let's say, extracted from the from the Krilov approach or not. But okay, uh, this is probably yeah, an open question, I guess. I, I think I think uh, there are hints that. Uh, it can be done. So there are recently there were some uh, paper, there was a paper about random matrix theory and uh, creed of complexity, where uh, essentially these these kind of ideas are are, are shown uh, to be true. Um, so so let me just give you just to get a feel also for the uh, what is the creed of space uh, and uh, in in a very simple example, and also to show you how a free system are are at least very, very uh, much, much below the, the bound for the creed of space dimension. Uh, let's look at a Hamiltonian of N of fermionic harmonic oscillators, which uh, satisfy um, anti-commutation relations as usual. Um, and let's take a single fermion operator as uh, written here. And commutators with the Hamiltonian would leave the operator a, in, in a single fermion sector. So all we get is um, we multiply the operator by, uh, by the omegas which appear in the Hamiltonian. So uh, the single, single uh, fermion sector is two n dimensional and therefore we expect, uh, depending of course on the coefficients here in this, in this operator, um, to be always smaller than or equal to 2n. And notice that this is much, much smaller than uh, the bound uh, for, for the, the, the bound for the creed of space dimension, which would generically go like e to the 2n for a uh, Hilbert space of, of, of size e to the n. So uh, this is just an example where, uh, where the creed of space dimension is much, much smaller. OK, uh, so any questions about this? Okay, uh, so let's um, let's follow up and uh, try to construct a basis, an orthonormal basis for the Krylov space. And uh, the way to do it is the Lanchus algorithm. Um, Sorry, uh, Ruth, yeah. we have a question from of Dilip. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah, Dilip, yeah. Please. Is it in the chat or? Yeah, maybe in the previous slide. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Still, uh, I couldn't able to follow. What, what do you mean by integrable here? Oh, uh, just the fact that uh, that it's a free system. I mean, uh, uh, you could easily find the spectrum of of this uh, of, of this uh, Hamiltonian, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean. Uh, so then, like, kind of how to quantify in some sense? Like, it's just a mathematical proof. I mean. Um. I suppose people would regard every free system as an integrable. I mean, I mean, this the spectrum is is uh, is very simple, right? The spectrum is just you have either one fermion, uh, which will give you energy. So you have either uh, no fermions, right? So you have zero energy, and then you have all possible single uh, fermion um, uh, 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 states which have energies omega one, omega two, and so on, right? Yeah. And then you have two fermion sector which would have energies of omega one plus omega two, uh, omega one plus omega three, and so on, right? And uh, and the, the the largest energy would have uh, energy which is just the sum of all of them, right? Yeah. So in in some sense, like 
any any non-interacting system in is integrable? Is I would say so. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there are people here who are much bigger experts than I am, uh, and how to uh, uh, decide whether a system is integrable or not. But uh, I think that uh, that the free system would always be considered uh, as integrable. Yeah. But but I yeah well in general uh, deciding whether a system is integrable or not is not such an easy uh, thing but in this case I think everybody would agree it, it it is it is an integrable system. Okay yeah thank yeah. Okay thank you so much for the question. Okay, um, so let's uh, let's construct a basis for the Quigley subspace. Um, in order to construct an orthonormal basis, we need to define an inner product for operators. And uh, we take the simplest possible inner product. Um, it could be thought of as the infinite temperature inner product or whatever you want. But uh, essentially, it's, it's the, the simplest possible choice. It is just uh, the trace of the product of the operators. And we normalize by the Hilbert space dimension. Um, and uh, of course, norms will just be uh, the same thing, just uh, replace uh, one of the operators by um, itself, right? So this is a, a norm of an operator. And let's perform a Gramsci-Schmidt procedure, but a very specific one, not the usual one. So how are we going to do that? We will firstly, um, the first step will be to normalize our seed operator. Um, at the next step, we will commute our we will commute O zero, which is the normalized seed operator, with the Hamiltonian, and remove the projection of the commutator on uh, on O zero. If you do the algebra, you plug this into you plug this thing here into the trace. You will see this gives you zero, and you're just left with the commutator. For the first element, we just get the commutator. Uh, next, we define the norm of, of curly A1. And we set the next operator to be the normalized version of A1. Um, we go on by uh, commuting O1 with a Hamiltonian and removing projections again. And if you do the algebra, you will find that uh, the result is the commutator of O1 with a Hamiltonian minus uh, the first uh, coefficient b1 we define times uh, the uh, operator o0. And again, we define the norm of the operator a2 and set the next operator to be the normalized um, a2. Um, now, it may look uh, trivial, but um, the, these operators, uh, sorry, these numbers b1 and B2, and we're going to define more of them, uh, are going to be important for this, for this discussion. So pay attention to them. Um, so we could generalize this procedure. If we go on, we'd see that we actually find a general um, recurrence equation for the nth operator. And uh, this is essentially the, what's known as the Lanzos algorithm, which takes here as input a Hermitian operator so um, we, we take as input an Hermitian operator and a Hamiltonian. Uh, again, we're doing, we'll do the first uh, three steps, which is to normalize our seed operator to define uh, the first uh, element by commuting with a Hamiltonian, finding the norm and normalizing. And then we uh, proceed in a, an automatic way uh, for uh, n greater than one. That's what we do here in step three. And uh, we define the nth element as the commutator of the um, of O n minus one with a Hamiltonian and uh, minus uh, the uh, multiplication of B n minus one O n minus two. So this is a, a, a general step. We compute the norm of this operator. If the norm is zero, we stop the algorithm. Otherwise, we uh, go on and define the next operator in the Krilov basis. Um, it's important that this, uh, this uh, algorithm stops. And this is also a good way to check that actually uh, you're doing things right when you put this on a computer. Um, if you're doing things wrong, your algorithm won't stop. And uh, notice 
that uh, the reason uh, this algorithm stops is once we exhausted all directions in the wheel of subspace, we, once we remove all projections, so essentially we're doing a Gram-Schmidt at every step, although it's, it has a much simpler form, but really we are uh, removing all previous projections. Um, so at, at some point when, while removing all previous, uh, previous elements, projections over all previous elements, we uh, have no new directions to explore and we get a zero operator, which has a zero norm. So this is, this is an important point in this, in this algorithm. Um, so what is the output of, of, this, um, of this algorithm? We get a basis, which is known as the Krylov basis, and we get uh, the Lanchus sequence. So notice that uh, we have K elements in the Krylov basis, and we have uh, K minus one terms in the Lanchus sequence. Um, so is, is this uh, process uh, clear? And uh, of course, I want to explain what uh, we're going to do with this, right? Um, so what do we have now? Once we've done this, we have an orthonormal basis, a k-dimensional orthonormal basis with, uh, of course, um, uh, the property of orthonormality. And um, an important uh, aspect, uh, an important feature of the creative basis is that it is ordered according to the number of nested commutators with the Hamiltonian. So each, um, each operator uh, in, in the order O0, O1, O2, and so on, has an additional commutator with the Hamiltonian. So that's, that's an important thing. Um, another interesting feature is that the Lebelian is tridiagonal in the Krylov basis. So um, this is, of course, only a projection over the complete um, Hilbert space of operators, but you could write down uh, the Lebelian in this basis like this, and you will see that it is uh, tridiagonal. Um, you also, okay, so another comment is something I've already said, that the algorithm terminates once all direction in the field of space are exhausted. And, uh, and a technical uh, uh, point is that the algorithm as presented here uh, suffers from numerical instability at finite precision because uh, numerical errors uh, accumulate and, and make uh, uh, the, these operators uh, not really orthonormal to each other. Um, so any questions about, about this, this part of the talk where we have uh, constructed a basis for our Quilov subspace? Uh, we have a question from Alexei. Yep. Alexei, please. Yeah, thanks. A very simple question exactly about the last point, but I mean, there are, um, there are stable Gram-Schmidt uh, orthogonalization algorithms. Right. Right, that's that's true, uh, and one of the ways to stabilize um, the the Lanthus algorithm is just to perform uh, a complete Gram-Schmidt, which means at every step we don't just do uh, the Lanthus step, so we don't just uh, remove, um, we we don't just do this, right? We actually um, remove projections over all previous operators, so that's one way to stabilize uh, the algorithm. And another way is a bit more sophisticated, is to estimate when you need to do that. Because uh, you see, the problem is that what you need for, 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 um, for doing this, for uh, performing a full Grand Schmidt, you need to uh, keep, to store in your memory, in the memory of the computer, um, all of the previous uh, Krylov elements. Um, and uh, and also it's uh, you know it's computationally uh, expensive to perform a Gram Schmidt step at every at every step of the algorithm. So there are uh, like there are some um, more efficient ways to 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 perform the the kind of full Gram Schmidt. So where you just estimate when you need to do that and you don't do it at every step. So that that's mm -hmm. that's a, a good question. Yes. Well, I guess this is called, I mean, this estimation is, I think, usually referred to as uh, restarting. Um, well, uh, I know it as a partial reorthogonalization. But, uh, but yes, I know there's also a method of restarted uh, Lanchus algorithm, but I, I, I don't know so much about it. Maybe, maybe they're related. 
um okay yeah thanks thank you so much uh, Ruth, I have a question also yeah. about technical issue. Uh, so, so these bees, uh, the norms, uh, they 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 can be kind of they can. There's no order, right? Necessarily, they can be like uh, the numbers can be dropping and then just jumping to to much larger. So, kind you of uh, if it's a continuous profile or not? Is yes, right? yes. If you have kind of monotonous behavior or That's probably not, right? Yeah, for, firstly, it's a very good question. Uh, secondly, it really depends on the system and on the operator. We believe that for a chaotic system, there is a kind of universal profile, which you will see uh, towards the end of, of the talk. Um, I see that I really have to hurry up. But <laughs> yes, but it's a very good question. And in general, there's no specific pattern for how, what the B sequence should look like, except mm -hmm. as I say, for a cha for chaotic systems, uh, where, where uh, you know, based on some, uh, uh, re, uh, some research we've done on random matrix theory, we do see a kind of universal profile for, for the B sequence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So thank uh, you. Yeah? Thank you. Um, we have another question from yeah. Dilip. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I just have a very basic question. Uh, so, for example, let's say in usual Lanczos algorithm, we have started with like the initial random vector, right? An initial, uh, you're saying uh, an initial random vector? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, I mean, in, in usual Lanczos algorithm, when we do this okay. kind of algorithm, so we mm -hmm. started with, we start with like an in initial random vector. Mm -hmm. So, right. but here, here, this operator you are choosing, like, is kind of, it should be also random or it depends upon your problem. I mean, yeah, here, here we're using the Lanczos algorithm, not in the usual way. So, usually it is used to find uh, the largest uh, and smallest eigen values of a matrix. Uh, here we're using it uh, for physical reasons. Um, so therefore we do want to choose our initial operator and we also want to choose um, the Hamiltonian. Um, and we're not using it in the, in the usual way. But, but that, that's correct. In, in general, people start with, a, with a, some random uh, vector because they don't care what is, the, what is the, they don't care about the vector, they care about the matrix. So in this case, the matrix is alluvialian. I see, okay, okay, yeah. Right, yeah. but that, that's a good question. And uh, just a remark, um, in chaotic systems, even if you choose carefully your, uh, your starting operator, in the energy basis, it looks pretty much random. It satisfies uh, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So in that sense, it's, uh, it, it would be considered a good operator in the sense of the Lantus algorithm which means it has uh, projections over, over all the eigenvalues, uh, eigen, eigen uh, states of the Lubelian. I see. Right, yeah, except yeah. for the diagonal, which is, a, you know, uh, which is essentially a single eigen, eigen uh, direction of the Lubelian. Okay, yeah. Okay? Uh, I think Alexei has uh, another question maybe or sure. comment. No, I just didn't lower the hand. I always forget. Uh -huh. Okay, happy for any questions. <laughs> okay, um, so so let me let me go on, um, and uh, I think I, I told you all the comments I wanted to say about the Lanczos algorithms. And thanks for the excellent questions. Um, now we're going to use this uh, this basis. Um, we're going to use our our uh, our Quillet basis to expand our time dependent operator over this basis. Um, and we're going to take our coefficients to be, uh, to be time dependent. Um, and uh, notice there is this factor of i here in the expansion, and that is because uh, the operators in the Krilov basis alternate between uh, Hermitian and anti-Hermitian. So we multiply by i to the n to make them all Hermitian. Um, so we will now use the Heisenberg time evolution equation written down here in 17, and uh, from which we could find uh, our, our differential recurrence equation for these, uh, these coefficients phi n of t. Um, so notice that all that goes into this equation are the Lanczos coefficients. So um, it's some kind of, of uh, of hopping equation, it's a it's a differential uh, a differential equation, um, and and 
and it depends only on the and the Lantris coefficient. Um, we also need, of course, uh, some initial conditions. And uh, we, of course, the initial condition is that at time equals zero, um, all our, our all the support is on on O zero. So so that's uh, so th these are this is the equation we get. Um, and essentially, if we study uh, these these wave functions, we these wave functions phi n phi n of t, we know everything about the operator's evolution. Um, so. Let me just uh, comment about uh, the time evolution on the Krilov basis. So as I said, the boundary condition uh, phi n at zero at time equals zero is delta n zero. Make sure that the operator starts off at the first Krilov element. Um, the most important comment is that the dynamics of the operator along the Krilov basis depend only on the Lantus coefficients. And, uh, we could think of these phi n t's as wave functions on the Krilov basis, in the sense that they are the time-dependent projection of the operator uh, O of t on the Krilov basis element O of n. And from unitarity, we have that the norm of this of this uh, of this wave function is one. Um, any any questions about this? So this is uh, yeah, essentially how we're going to analyze the time evolution on, on, uh, of, of an operator on the Krilov basis. Okay, so at last we arrived at the actual definition of uh, k-complexity. And uh, one way to think of k-complexity is as a probe of the time-dependent profile of uh, the wave function phi n of t. And um, the first such probe, which was introduced by uh, Parker, Kao, Avdoshkin, Scafidi, Altman at, at 2018, is the average position on the Krilov chain. And we call it a chain because it is ordered. Um, it was, they, they call it K complexity, uh, Krilov complexity. And it is the usual way we define, um, uh, we define an, the average position uh, using a wave function. So you uh, probably remember from quantum mechanics where you find the average position of a particle given its wave function. Um, so that's uh, the, first, the first equation here. And uh, later on uh, in, in, in the paper uh, I wrote together with uh, Jose Verbon and uh, Eliezer Rabinovich and Ritam Sinha in 2019, we introduced another probe of this time-dependent profile and is the average amount of randomness uh, in the way we usually define uh, uh, entropy. So we call it k-entropy and it is the usual way we define um, uh, uh, entropy on a distribution. So these are the main ways we're going to, uh, to probe our, um, our, our, uh, our wave functions, which essentially de fully describe the time evolution of, of an operator. And uh, the main uh, comments on, on k-complexity is are that uh, k-complexity is bounded by the Krilov space dimension. So uh, cl clearly, it is an average position on a, uh, a, a ch uh, chain of length k, so it, it cannot be uh, larger than k. Um, it also uh, depends only on the Hamiltonian of the system and on the seed operator, Curlio. So uh, these are nice uh, features. And uh, let's now, um, le let's try to uh, investigate what, what all this actually looks like in an in, in actual model. Uh, to do that, we chose Oh, so firstly, firstly, are there any questions about um, about uh, um, the wave functions, uh, the definition of k-complexity, uh, the definition of k-entropy, or anything of, of, of that sort? Okay, so um, let's uh, go on and actually uh, finally uh, show some uh, numerical results. Um, so firstly, we chose uh, the SYK model with a uh, four fermion interaction because it is uh, known to be a maximally chaotic quantum system. 
so it is uh, considered maximally chaotic in the sense that it features level repulsion, which we've discussed earlier. Uh, typical small operators satisfy the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Uh, it saturates the bound in the Lyapunov exponent, and, uh, and there are more uh, in this list. Um, but I mentioned the main ones, which are level repulsion and ETH for us. Um, and we will work in, in a finite uh, number of fermion uh, system in order to study uh, long time effects. So not in the thermodynamic limit. So uh, more specifically, we worked with a complex SYK4. It involves L complex fermions. Uh, the Hamiltonian is written down in, uh, in 21. Um, the, these fermions, of course, satisfy uh, anti-commutation relations. And uh, the, the coupling constants are drawn, as usual, from a Gaussian distribution with zero mean and a specific variance that goes like uh, some energy scale j squared. Um, and it's important to note that the Hilbert space for L complex fermions is of dimension two to the L. Okay. But yeah. uh, here you, I mean, you restrict to a single, uh, let's say, um, you know, this Hamiltonian preserve number of particles. So you, you restrict to that particular sector, right? That's right. And that's in the next yeah. one. I see. Is there any particular reason to choose this instead of the Majorana, just this conservation that makes the numerics more uh, amenable, or? Uh, yes, it is. I mean, it, it, it was uh, important because, you know, every scaling of the problem makes it really, really, really hard to, to actually do. Exactly. So you no. chose them just for this reason, right? Uh, yes, I, I, I think that that would be a, a good, uh, yeah, a good description okay. of why, yes. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, Oh, well, of, of course, it also makes the Hilbert space bigger, right? So it's a bit, you know, there is some kind yeah. of playoff, right? Uh, because for the Majorana case, we have two to the L over two, the, the total Hilbert space. So yeah, it's uh, complicated. But anyway, I don't think the result would be very much uh, different. Um, so the operator we study is the hopping operator. And uh, it is just an operator that knows about the L, the L and L minus one site, um, sites, and it is a uh, Hermitian. Uh, and in, in particular, in a paper by Julian Zahner and uh, uh, Manuel Vielma, it was shown that it satisfies uh, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And as uh, Dario already remarked, we are going to work in a fixed occupation sector of the, um, of, of the Hamiltonian. And uh, this is because both our Hamiltonian and operator commute with the number operator. So uh, when we uh, work with both of these guys, we don't leave a specific uh, um, occupation sector. Um, we will work in the biggest such sector, which is the half filled one. And uh, it has dimension uh, uh, L choose L over two. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Oh, I see. This is the reason why you decided to take uh, this, let's say, two operators, not C dagger plus C, because otherwise you spoil uh, the conservation. OK, I got it. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. It's actually okay. quite important. Yes, yes. Sorry, I, can I ask oh, yeah. a question? So um, when you choose operator O, yeah. what is guideline? What is? guideline of choosing operator O? Uh, what is the guideline? Uh, it should be a local operator. It should be an operator that is not extensive in the number of fermions. That's the only thing. You could actually choose almost anything you want as long as it's Hermitian. And as Dario just remarked, it satisfies the symmetries of the sector you want to work in. So then everything else is fine. You really can so, choose anything you like. I, I see. So. Showing that this operator satisfying ETH is equivalent to any local operator satisfying ETH? Yes, 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 yes. You would still like to check it out. So we also use the fact that this has already been checked. Um, 
I, although I suppose any local operator would be just as good. So I don't, I don't think it matters. I, I mean, we, we just wanted to be careful and make sure that we actually use an operator which we know satisfies uh, EPH. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, okay, so uh, we're ready to actually show some, um, some numerical results. And um, for the complex uh, SYK4, we expect the creel of space dimension to saturate the bound. Uh, as we said, because it satisfies level repulsion and uh, our operator is dense, it satisfies uh, ETH. Um, and I just uh, wrote down some numbers to, to give you a feel for the size of the creel of um, space dimension. Um, so the system we looked at had uh, eight, nine, and 10 fermions. Um, if you compute uh, the dimension of the half-filled sector for eight fermions, you get 70. Uh, you square that, you get um, 4,900. And then you compute uh, d squared minus d plus one, and you get uh, something around 5,000. Uh, in the case of nine fermions, we work in the, in, it's not, there's no half-filled sector, but we use um, uh, five out of the nine to be filled. Uh, we find the dimension of the Hilbert space to be 126. Uh, the full Hilbert space of operators is um, around uh, 6,000, and similarly is the dimension of K of the creedal space. And the largest system we looked at has 10 fermions, uh, which with a Hilbert space of size 252, and a Hilbert space of operators of order 60,000. So, um, so this is, and that's also that dimension of essentially the dimension of the creedal space. Um, so in general, in the following, I will just say that the creedal space has dimension uh, e to the 2L. It's not uh, uh, strictly correct, but it's, uh, it's just uh, a way of, of talking about, um, about you know, general features of, 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 the, of the dimension. Um, uh, just in order not to, 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 uh, to, have, uh, to use the actual numbers. Um, so in the, in the bottom of the slide, you see um, the, the various uh, Lambda sequences for, um, so here we have eight fermions, here we have nine, and here we have 10 fermions. Um, and the main thing to notice, first of all, they all terminate at the correct places. So for example, for uh, L equal 10, we terminate at uh, a little bit more than 60,000 as should be from uh, our calculations. And uh, the other thing to notice is that there is a very, very, very small slope. Um, so notice that the height here is order one and uh, the length here uh, in our, in our uh, way of saying it is order e to the 2L. So uh, the slope in general, very generally, is of order e to the minus 2L. So this we would say is a, uh, a non-perturbative result in, in the, in the, um, in, in the e, to the, e to the L. Um, in, the, in the right side, you see a log plot. So there's, uh, this, is, this is a log scale here. And this allows you to see a, a little bit more features of the initial part of the B sequence. And uh, if you look carefully, you will see that the peak for each of these uh, different sizes happens a little bit later. Um, which should be, that should be the case. Um, now the initial growth is hard to tell because there's only like 10, uh, it's hard to tell if it's linear or something else. Uh, here it essentially looks, it looks more like log because we're plotting it in log scale. Um, but there's only, there's only a few Lanchus coefficients here. So, uh, but nevertheless, there is a kind of, there's a transition at, uh, in the in the features of the B sequence at uh, something like n goes like the number of fermions n goes like l so that's an important feature to to notice here. Um, so let me uh, show you our our maybe nicest uh, result uh, again, which is the Lanta sequence for for SYK with uh, ten fermions. Uh, essentially, I already told you all of the details, but do notice how uh, pretty much smooth it looks. Of course, um, we, it's very much zoomed out. Um, as I said, the scale on the, 
on the y-axis is much, much, it's exponentially smaller than the uh, scale of the, of the, of the x-axis. Um, as I said, there is a non-perturbative slope of order e to the minus 2L. And uh, notice that averaging, uh, so we have here a single realization uh, plotted in light blue and above it uh, some kind uh, uh, an average over five random realizations. Um, and notice just uh, for the sake of, of understanding uh, what's, what's going into this plot, uh, that if we actually plotted it to scale um, and we, the, the the x-axis would have a length of a couple of hundred meters. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so, so this is a very, very, very tiny uh, slope. Um, but nevertheless, it, it terminates uh, where it should. And, uh, and this is, this is uh, the result we get. And we believe um, that this is going to be a general result for a for chaotic system. Um, so, once we have, as we said, if we have the uh, Lange sequence, we could find all the wave functions. And the wave functions also, also have uh, some very nice features. Uh, so here I plotted different timescales. Uh, the, the basic timescale, because we're using j equals one, so um, the energies are always, of the, the, the largest energies are of order one. Um, so, so the, uh, so, so firstly, let's look at very early times. So in terms of what we've been uh, looking at earlier, um, these are times which are smaller than uh, log of, uh, of the number of, of, of log L. So these are times up to something like T equal one. Um, so at this point, we have a kind of an unraveling of the, of the wave function. It starts off essentially as a delta function here. Uh, and no, uh, pr no uh, support uh, anywhere else. And then it starts unraveling pretty quickly. Um, at the next, the next step, uh, so yeah, the next, in, the, in, the, in the next uh, set of time scales, we see uh, that this, de this original delta function becomes a kind of traveling pulse. And it's getting a tail. If you look carefully, you'll see there's some kind of tail here. Um, and when we go to even larger time scales, so these are time scales of order, uh, we could say 10, um, we see that the pulse is becoming lower. And the, I mean, the, the peak is becoming lower and we're getting a longer and longer tail. And uh, here we have uh, time scales of even, uh, even larger time scales. And you see the tail is becoming more and more serious. Uh, there's more randomness and uh, the peak is becoming uh, shorter. Of course, it has to happen because uh, our wave function is normalized. Um, so, so here I plotted results for uh, eight fermions uh, because the case for 10 fermions would just be too big, uh, too, too long to actually, I mean, there's like 60,000 elements there. So uh, I chose to, to just show you a smaller, the smaller system, but the features are very similar. Um, and let me just show you very late times. So here uh, for, so just recall that for L equal eight, uh, the Krylov space dimension is of order uh, 5,000, and that's, uh, that's the, the, the length I, I plotted here. And notice that um, for, for late time, so times of order, you know, 1,000, um, our wave function doesn't have any peak anymore. So look at the purple one. This is an earlier one. It's at time 2,000. Uh, then the red one is next, the time 2,500. And uh, you see that there's no peak, but the wave function is still traveling. It still didn't reach the end of the creative phases. Now, if you take some very, very, very long time scale, you see that uh, the wave function is essentially randomized over the creative phases. So that's, these are the main features for uh, for the projection over the, 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 the Krylov basis for a chaotic system. Um, so let's see what we could learn from, from these features. So we have seen that there is a point, there is a time for which um, the, the wave function is totally randomized. And let's try to estimate what would be the value of K complexity at that time. So firstly, uh, we have equal support on each of the each of the um, each of the uh, 
Creel of elements, we, we, it will be one over square root of k. Um, and we could estimate the saturation value. So we plug in phi squared into the formula for uh, k complexity. So here we have phi at t sat um, squared. And if you do the algebra, you find that it goes like k over 2, which here we just abbreviated to be e to the 2l over 2. So this would be our estimate for the saturation value of k complexity. Um, what happened with uh, k entropy? And for that, um, we again, we plug in uh, phi squared at saturation, and uh, we essentially have k terms of log 1 over k. And uh, if we recall, so here we have uh, log, um, sorry, this should have a minus sign, log of k. And um, this is log, essentially log e to the l or e to the 2l, which, um, yeah, OK. Essentially, it, it, looks, it, it, uh, it turns out to be um, it of order l. So we expect uh, k entropy to saturate at order uh, l, at value l, the number of fermions. So let's see if these expectations are actually fulfilled in, um, in actual computations. And, uh, and also, please remember the, our first uh, part of the discussion, where we uh, showed what are the general features we expect from quantum complexity. So notice that we have here this nonlinear growth for time scales which are smaller than, uh, so t is smaller than log of the number of sorry, let me write it now in terms of L, log of L. Uh, then we have a linear growth in, 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 uh, in the next. Uh, so these are, these are time scales greater than log of L. And, um, uh, and then we have uh, from, from, this linear, from this linear growth at the beginning, we have to reach some, to, we have to reach saturation at times. So here, um, here we're talking about times of order the size of the credo space, so e to the 2L. Um, so here we actually have reached saturation as we expected. Um, and in the, the final uh, picture, you will see the full uh, result, except for what happens at the very beginning. And notice that indeed, um, the, the saturation value is half the credo space uh, dimension. So just to remind you, uh, the credo space dimension here is k equals something like 60,000. So we found that the saturation happens around 30,000, as, as it should be. So that's uh, k over 2. Um, and indeed, saturation happens at times exponential in the number of fermions. Uh, so these are, these are the main features uh, to see for k complexity. Uh, it is important to notice that it has the features of quantum complexity as, uh, as, uh, described, as described in the beginning of the talk. Um, and let's go on to what we see for K entropy. Uh, so at early times, so here we have again, T smaller than log of the number of fermions. We have a kind of rapid growth. Uh, then we have a, a, a slower growth at later times. Um, and eventually, uh, we have saturation uh, at, again, at, at pretty, so actual saturation uh, happens at times, I would say, of order the credo space dimension, again, e to the 2L. Um, and in the final uh, picture here, we see a log plot of uh, K entropy. And notice there's some interesting feature, which we don't uh, really yet know what it means, but there is some nice feature here at, uh, at time going like L. And, um, and we have saturation as we expected at 10. So we're working here. With, so this is, these are plots for 10 fermions. Um, and yes, and at the right time scales, e to the 2L. Um, so these, these are the, the results. And I know I totally ran out of time. Um, and let me just, before, uh, before finishing, let me just uh, tell you what the conclusions are. And um, we have, so we computed the complete Lanza sequence in a large or at least a, a, a finite, but not so small uh, quantum chaotic system. Um, 
we computed, we showed that k-complexity has the features expected from quantum complexity. We also showed that k-complexity is naturally bounded by the Krilov space dimension. And we also found that k-complexity indeed saturates at time scales exponential in the number of, of degrees of freedom with value exponential in the number of degree of freedom. And uh, we also uh, found some interesting things about K entropy, which again saturates at time scales of order uh, exponential in the number of degrees of freedom uh, with a value of order the number of degrees of freedom. So that's all I wanted to tell you about today. Sorry for going over time, but it was really uh, nice. And thank you so much for, for all the questions. And I'm happy to get to take any other questions. Uh, so please, please ask. Uh, thank you, Ruth, for a very nice talk. Let us thank our speaker. So, please, questions. May I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. So, yeah. So, you showed um, this matrix, which is tri diagonal right. for a chaotic system that has very, very nice continuous distribution starting from the top and very slowly decreasing. And I were and you also mentioned that universal feature of this distribution. <laughs> and uh, how do I read it? How do I read a um, connection between this chaotic system and information about this distribution of a B and the chaotic system that we usually say label recursion? How do I connect these informations? Right. So you're saying, um, you're saying, this should be another kind of uh, um, character of of chaotic systems. In general, you could be able, you should be able to compute the Lanchus sequence, and you're expecting to find these particular features um, for for the for the Lanchus sequence with these particular dimensions and so on. Um, so. Firstly, we did some experimentations with random matrices, and we found that indeed we find a very similar profile. Um, now, it's not, I think it's not so easy uh, to actually, you know, start with a kind of Wigner semicircle, uh, um, you know, uh, spectrum as, and, and, uh, and show that this will be the, the the feature, these will be the features of the of the Lancia sequence. Uh, I don't know of any work that has actually done that. We've of course been trying, but I don't think I could say that we actually have succeeded to show analytically that this is this is the result. But it should be. There should be a way to do that. I, I agree. Um, there is there were a, there's a little bit of work. Uh, people started to do this work in the paper I mentioned previously about uh, random matrices and and uh, and Krilov spaces. Uh, okay, they did it with relation to uh, JT gravity and uh, and all sorts of um, ideas from from um, from qu from quantum gravity, um, which apparent which uh, are, is known to be to be related to random matrix theory. So if you want, you could look over there. They they do have at least. Uh, some kind of uh, um, qualitative uh, results for at least showing how the tail, the final part of the distribution looks. But the complete thing is not, I don't think anybody knows how to show it analytically yet. So that's, that's, a, that's an interesting um, uh, thing to, to, to actually study. Could you, could you briefly comment about how does the, the distribution of the B, how does it look like for the integral systems? For integrable systems, um, it's well. So I, I I've been doing uh, several trials, and it really varies. It really it really uh, it. Some of them are very um, very random. Some of them are more similar to what you get for chaotic systems. It's it's. Um, I don't think there's any universality. That's 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 the general thing I can tell you. And I mean, you could just take uh, you could take. Uh, the simplest possible example, which is a for me a, a bosonic harmonic oscillator with a simple uh, operator like the position operator, and you will see that there's actually just a single uh, element in the Lanchus sequence. So there's like there's a whole spectrum of what kind of things you could get. 
Um, so I, I, I think this is, these are really uh, future uh, research uh, prospects. So, so that's let very me just, yeah. Let me just add one comment more since I, I, I'm more focused on this. I mean, at least for free systems, I mean, you can you can see a clear difference between chaotic and let's say free systems. So if you want really the, the extreme of integrable systems for the first bees, I mean, the first bees as Ruth was showing in the paper, in, um, in the plots, they have, they tend to have a linear trend. I mean, a linear grow, even though it's in one dimension, they can be corrected by some logarithmic correction. But okay, let's say roughly you have a grow instead for free systems. Essentially, you don't see any, I mean, they remain of order one and they don't have any grow. Nevertheless, uh, uh, a point that I, I'm trying to, to, to finalize now is that even though they don't have any grow, some interesting information can be extracted also in that case. So essentially, okay, yeah, Ruth is showing the plot. So this initial grow that is more or less linear or log logarithmically or whatever, you will not see that grow in a free system. You will see something somehow oscillating around a, um, a constant value. Nevertheless, some interesting information is hidden in that fluctuations. They're not random. And this is something that I'm trying to, to finalize in the next, uh, hopefully, few weeks. Uh, yeah. That's right. Um, and I think uh, it's not, uh, I mean, at least in the paper of Altman, where they started, uh, they, they actually uh, claim to show that, they're, that that's, what, that's a way to distinguish um, integrable from chaotic systems. They show that for integrable systems, you also have a square root of n behavior. Right. So, so that's yeah. another, another type. So I think really integrable systems, are, there's no you universal. You can see whatever you want. Yes, yeah. you could actually get almost anything you want. Great, great. Right. I see. Thank you for both. Thank you. We have a question uh, from Alexei. Yeah, thanks. Well, actually, two questions. One is a bit of a continuation of what Kun Wu was asking. Um, is there any, dis I mean, do systems that are critical show any different behavior? Uh, by critical oh. here, I mean, um, say, systems that you get um, at uh, say a uh, metal insulator transition. I would say that these, uh, I don't think it, it, it has been studied yet. Um, so. Yeah. Right, I mean, the reason I I'm asking is that, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think those, I mean, they, um, at least to me, they, they don't have the, uh, well, I mean, the simple level repulsion, they, they not have a Poissonian spectrum. So they might combine perhaps features of both and I'm actually, I don't even know if they have a universal uh, level repulsion statistics mm -hmm. to begin with, right. but I was curious. Okay, the second question is much more technical. I was actually, while we were talking about the Lantzosch um, construction, I was wondering um, if you want to compute the evolution, the time evolution of the operator. So one approach, if I understood it correctly, is what you did, uh, basically rewrite everything in the Lantzosch basis and then do the diagonalization and uh, study the evolution. But you can also do, um, I mean, there are algorithms to perform time evolution without diagonalization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Um, uh, did you try those? Or, I mean, there are some uh, reasons these algorithms are not effective in this uh, setting. I mean, one I can immediately think of is that you can, I mean, uh, you probably cannot uh, access very long times, but definitely short. And, well, actually, the times I saw on the graphs, I thought were should should be still accessible with these methods. Uh, but on the, the benefit is that you can go to um, larger sizes. So for instance, on this slide, the Krylov space dimension 63,000 would be easily tractable by these methods. That's right, that's right. And uh, we were actually, we, we were not just interested in the, uh, you know, operator evolution. We were interested in how it's, you know, and its projection over the Krylov basis. So we have in mind a picture that, um, that the, the, the Krylov basis in some sense is a measure of, you know, so, so the ordering of the Krylov basis is a kind of measure of how complex your operator is. So uh -huh. it, it, the, the idea was not to actually compute, and you're right, in order to compute operator time evolution, I think um, there, are, there are many methods to just compute, you know, the ex exponents of, of the Hamiltonian. Um, it is true that these are some of the methods people use, but we, we had a completely different, 
re reason for for uh, for actually constructing the creel of basis and actually studying the evolution of the operator on this particular basis. Okay, this is, uh, this, this, yeah. Uh, we think of this basis as, as a special basis in the sense that it's, it's adapted to the evolution of the operator. And also notice that the wave functions on this basis have a, a, a important, a special feature that essentially uh, there's, there's almost no projection on on uh, on on elements beyond a certain point, right? So uh, this is something you would not see in a in a, in the usual, um, you know, just writing down an exponent and looking just at the at the commutators. So so uh, so w we kind of think of of, of evolution on the on the Krilov basis as the operator kind of exploring. The, the, the Hilbert space of operators and how much of the of the Hilbert space of operator the the operator has explored up to a certain point. Okay. Yeah. Well, then my sorry. One more subsequent question is then. Uh, but do you think there's? I mean, again, I'm I'm just trying to push the point that these uh, non dag well the methods that avoid diagonalization they allow you to access much larger systems. So I'm curious. Can you um, nevertheless? Um, uh, is there any chance um, these measures that you mentioned for the complexity or this whole idea of studying the complexity of the operator spreading can be restated in purely dynamical terms? Uh, I mean, that's not at all obvious. Yeah. Well, I mean, basically, can you compute them from this dynamical evolution rather than going in a particular basis? That's what, I, what I'm trying to, to ask. Yeah, you're saying you're asking um, the following. You're asking if I could just look at this. Uh, uh, sorry, not at this. To, to start from the uh, initial equation we started with, and to um, to see all sorts of of uh, features, uh, uh, some kind of of, of a quantity that has these these you know specific features with uh, with um, with different behaviors at different time scales. That, that's what you're asking. Yeah. Perhaps. So you need to come up with some quantity. That's 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 usually. Um, no. Well, I mean, I, I understand. I mean, th that's why I was trying to uh, to pose my question mildly. I mean, do you think there's a chance this can this is achievable? You mean without because you, I mean, you, Yeah, I mean, because you're clearly stating that the basis is really important and it's there's really a important. particular where things are very, very natural. So now I'm trying to start from a completely different view where you only have the access to dynamics, which in basically doesn't care about the basis. Right. And I'm still posing the question, can you still capture uh, the relevant uh, information, in particular how the um, dynamics of operators explores the, uh, the space? I think mm. it, is a, it is a natural thing to... Um, to ask, so so firstly, notice that the the Krilov basis is uh, is orthonormal, and in some sense, we're kind of uh, at every time step, we're asking how much how much new directions the operator is exploring, right? So so uh, we're every time we're asking how much how much direction how much um, of the of, of of new parts of the space which were not explored before. Uh, are, are explored now, um, and in terms of of just uh, of, of just using uh, this equation one and um, and trying to to understand the dynamics of the operator, I suppose one way is using uh, the just using quantum quantum computational complexity, uh, like I I described a little bit at the beginning. Um, but again, all of these, all of these ways of firstly, when you want to define complexity, you have to, uh, you need some rules. You need some rules of the game, right? Because who, who is to say that one operator is more complex than another? You need some kind of of, of measure and and uh, and some and, and some some set of rules, I, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I I, I think. This this particular method appeals to me because it is somewhat uh, intuitive and because it doesn't require so much um, uh, you know synthetic input. So that's that's uh, 
that's that's the reason um, I, I I do think uh, creole complexity is interesting. Um, and regarding other ways, uh, again, you would just have to to set to set what you how you define uh, complexity, right? That's mm -hmm. also the problem. It's also the problem with these kind of notions, right? That you need to to decide how how am I going to define that this operator is more complex than that operator, right? You could say no. it's more entangled, it's less entangled, it's local, you know, these kind of things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But yes, of course, it's interesting to think of of of, uh, of other ways. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. I have a question about the thermodynamic limit. So yes. does this make sense to ask, or yes. because uh, if I'm not f that familiar? Uh, with SYK, but I believe there are some analytical results in, in okay. the thermodynamic limit, right? So mm -hmm. right. can this help you? And uh, what does it kind of imply in your case? Um, so firstly, the, the original, um, so the, the original paper where K complexity was introduced uh, worked in the, so this paper, um, 2018 paper here, um, uh, so they worked in the thermodynamic limit. They worked uh, with SYK in the thermodynamic limit and uh, also at finite temperature. And uh, the problem, at least for us, with that limit is that you could explore uh, only what we would call early times. We wanted to explore uh, very, very long times. So times exponential in the number of degrees of freedom. And that's why I was emphasizing it throughout the talk. Um, but it did help us in the sense that, it, first of all, it tells us what happens at the beginning. So they showed that, indeed, uh, in the thermodynamic limit, the B sequence is, is essentially, uh, so if this is B of N and this is N, the B sequence is essentially linear. And they also showed that uh, K complexity uh, in this limit just grows exponentially all the way. So this is uh, CK of P, so you would have an exponential growth of K complexity. So this is essentially our starting part, right? Which we don't see very well because we don't have so many fermions. We have just 10 fermions. Um, uh, yes, and, and we were essentially, what we did in, in this paper is see whether we could, um, we could extend it to, to a finite, to finite systems where we could actually study uh, long time effects, long time behavior. So indeed, if you want to know more about the thermodynamic limit, so definitely uh, this paper has uh, quite a lot of, of, of work on that. Because s somewhat uh, n goes to infinity, right? So <laughs> kind of you always get just the linear part. You right, you exactly. So, exactly. so you right. would never see this uh, kind of uh, the other uh, going part. down, right? Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay. Okay, do we have Perhaps any... I can, I can ask a, a... I don't know if... Yeah, let's say a question. I mean, is there... A, I mean, it's not really related to your talk, but is there any, let's say, axiomatic definition of what you... Try? Because uh, you, if you want, you presented your, uh, your result saying, okay, I would expect that a reasonable notion of complexity should satisfy this kind of evolution at early time, middle time, and let's say late time. And you, you, you show that, let's say, your quantity, let's call it for the moment quantity, satisfy this. So you say it has the right, uh, I, mean, this is, I mean, it can be called complexity because it satisfied. The, is there an axiomatic, let's say, definition and you can show that K complexity satisfy that axioms or not? You mean- uh, In other words, is there, yeah. is there an axiomatic definition of what complexity should be and, and you can show that K complexity satisfy the axioms or not? Right, so there are uh, certain axioms people came up with in quantum computing. You know, there's a whole okay. list, of, you know, um, you know, kind of uh, triangle mm -hmm. inequalities and things like that. Um, I don't think we, we didn't check whether, uh, you know, all of these axioms are ticked. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure uh, it's, it really makes sense to do that. Uh, it's probably possible, but uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure it it um, it makes sense. Um, but yes, uh, I, I don't know. Um, 
Um, no, because the reason why, why I was asking is because, as you said, that the, let's say the computational complexity is a mess because you need to minimize and so on. Yeah. I was wondering if you can use this method that at, at the end is algorithmical to a posteriori reconstruct uh, the computational complexity without passing through a minimization property. That's a, ver that's a very good question. And yes, I mean, that's... Uh, it's of course it's something we we, we didn't uh, we didn't explore and mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's it is something that is worth exploring the question is that, that it, it's hard because uh, uh, computational complexity is hard right the side of exactly. computational complexity there are a set of axioms you're right but uh, but actually taking you know a a quantum system and computing uh, complexity for an evolving operator and evolving state is is really tough so in that sense i don't uh, know, know how to make progress in this kind of in this kind mm, of way. yeah i was wondering if this k complexity give information about the other which is which is tough that that would be let's say a way to sell k complexity saying okay we can let's say compute or let's say say something about this hard problem in quantum computing using this notion of krilov uh, basis and so on right Right. So I don't know. It's a, it's a good question. Okay. Really an open question. And uh, complexity is really, as you say, all over the place in that sense that there's many different definitions and not so many algorithmic definitions. Um, so that, that's another reason we really liked uh, this one. Uh, also because of our background from, you know, uh, trying to find a quantum dual to something happening in the bulk. Uh, this is pretty much more natural because it doesn't require any kind of um, additional information, as I said, no tolerance parameter, no gates, and so on. So for us, it was a nice quantity to, to, uh, uh, to look at. OK, uh, do we have any further questions? OK, in, I believe not. So in this case, let us thank uh, Ruth again. Um, and uh, with this, we conclude our today's seminar. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, whoever is interested in uh, further informal discussion